Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining in. This morning is our last uh, webinar in the Small Ruminant series. Thanks to SARE for hosting and allowing us to do this. Um, we are recorded, and all of these recordings will be posted on the SARE blog website. And I, I did send out links to the previous two, but I'll send out another email that's got links to everything. Um, there will be a poll at the end, so don't just run off. We, we need you to answer those few questions, and then we'll be good to go. So let me share my screen. Okay, so I'm going to talk about nutritional considerations for small ruminants this morning, and most of it's just um, basic information. I'm not going to go too in-depth about things, um, and then there's some resources at the end that I'm going to share to hopefully help you all out in things. So here we go. So just some basic requirements and some general rules of thumb. Um, sheep and goats should consume about two to 4% of their body weight every day. So not unlike cattle, you know, they recommend 2%. We do a little bit more. Um, they are a little smaller unit. And usually the 2% is more for maintenance and the 4% is gonna be more for those growing young animals. So early to mid gestation or the first 15 weeks of pregnancy, it's honestly not necessarily necessary to supplement unless they're just too thin or there's just terrible forages, no pasture or really bad quality hay. So I think we preach and it's always important to preach to have producers get hay tests. Um, because that way we can understand the nutritional value of that hay and if it is important to supplement or not. In late gestation, so the last six weeks of pregnancy, um, we do need to supplement. So about a half to a pound of grain per female per day is adequate. And this doesn't have to be something super expensive. It can just be a, a pound of corn per head per day. And that just helps because obviously they're pregnant, their nutritional needs have increased, and we wanna make sure they're ready to um, have those babies. And that also we're preventing any nutritional diseases from happening because there are several of them that happen those last six, six weeks of pregnancy. So early lactation or those first six to eight weeks where they're producing milk for their offspring, we need to supplement about a pound of grain per offspring being nursed. So if she's just got a single, then you just need to feed her a pound. But if she's got triplets, you probably need to feed her three pounds. Again, this is just to ensure she doesn't get too thin and to make sure the milk that she's producing is nutritious for those offspring. And of course, they are ruminant animals, so it's important that they always have some form of roughage whether that's out on the pasture, if it happens to be green and there's actually pasture for them to eat or if it's in the form of hay. But again, it needs to be of at least a moderate quality for it to be really worthwhile. And they are ruminants, they have a rumen and they need those refuges to make sure the, the good bacteria is doing what it needs to in their gut. So some feeding management strategies that we talk about, um, feeder space. So they are smaller animals than cattle, um, but we need to ensure that there's enough bunk space for them. So we don't want them going in and having to fight. We wanna make sure there's plenty of room. So you might have to have several feeders out there in order for them to all get a fair share of the pile and separate them. So separate the young ewes and does from the older ones because their nutritional needs are different. And especially once they've had offspring, separate the ones that have singles from the ones that have you know, twins or triplets because those are also gonna have different nutritional needs. Keep your feet up off the ground. So we deal with, as y'all learned last week, parasites and those parasites are found on the ground. So if we just go dump feed on the ground all the time, that's where their noses and mouths are gonna go to get feed. So it's important that we've got feed bunks out there. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Um, just, I, my dad has troughs that he rigged out of some two by four. Um, clean, fresh water is important um, to have available every day. So one thing, we don't have 
the real high troughs that cattle do. So those sometimes end up getting feces. Important to make sure that they have a clean, fresh water, make sure no algaes uh, growing on top. So some minerals and vitamin considerations. We need to feed loose, free choice minerals. So avoid blocks. They're not natural liquors, and so they're going to go try to nibble. And if they're going to nibble at a block, they're more likely to break a tooth. So we suggest just loose mineral for them to have out and make it free choice. So that way it's always available. So when they need it, they can go eat it. A two to one calcium to phosphorus ratio. This is important to help prevent urinary calcula, especially in males. And make sure that those um, vitamins A, D, and E are adequately available in minerals, especially in the winter months. You know, vitamin E is found in green grass, and we don't have green grass in the winter. Um, and so we need to make sure that's available. And then vitamin D is what we consider the sunshine vitamin. And again, there's not that much going on in winter. So we need that vitamin D for calcium absorption, absorption and metabolism, because again, there's some nutritional diseases, especially associated with uh, late pregnancy that need that calcium to be absorbed by the body. Selenium. This is one that we hear a lot in Arkansas because overall Arkansas is considered somewhat of a deficient state. And so it's really important to help prevent white muscle disease that selenium and vitamin E are readily available to them if, if there is a deficiency on their farm. So soil testing is very important for producers. I mean, obviously we should be uh, encouraging it. It's a free resource for them, um, but also so they can understand what they have available on their pastures. So copper is the only thing we worry about in sheep because too much can lead to copper toxicity. Goats, we don't really worry much about. There's honestly not a threshold of copper for goats. So it's totally fine if they go get a cattle mineral and feed for their goats, but sheep need to actually have a sheep mineral. So it's good to note that you can feed goats sheep feed, but you should not feed sheep goat feed. And this is why it's because of that copper level that's available to goats, but should not be available to sheep. So some basic pasture management things. Uh, sheep are natural grazers. So they prefer forbs and they will graze closer to the ground than goats will. But goats are natural browsers. So they, they're up looking for things to eat and they prefer shrubs and they graze from the top down. So when you see goats on their hind legs trying to get those leaves in the trees, that's why. It's because that's what they prefer. They prefer to be out in the, the areas that, that have shrubs or uh, green briars or things like that because they're, they're browsers and that's what they do. So that's why if you've ever got um, people who need to clean up a pasture from brush, Goats can be a really good option for that, and they can um, kill out green briars and, and even cedar trees that are really young saplings, they can kill those out as well. So some best management practices, we need to monitor the forage height, and this is imperative for parasite loads. Um, we don't want them to graze below four inches, so keeping those pastures in good health and keeping that, that forage high is important. So stocking rates, we recommend two to three per acre. Um, that way they're not overgrazing and there's plenty of forages out there for everyone. If you've got producers who are running cattle and sheep or goats together, then we recommend a one-to-one -one ratio. So one cow unit per one sheep or one goat unit. Nutritional quality. So I think this is the number one thing I find when a producer calls me and says, I'm having issues, my sheep or goats are dying, can you come help? And I go out to the farm and unfortunately this is what it looks like. It's pretty much just bare ground. There's no forage out there for them to eat. 
They may or may not have hay out there for them. So really bringing home the fact that these animals don't always naturally just go to the ground to eat. Um, you know, if you've got goats and this is what it looks like, they're probably struggling pretty bad. So doing those soil tests, making sure those forages are at the right height, but more importantly, that they're not overstocking because we do see that a lot. So multi-species or co-species grazing is a great tool. Um, multi-species meaning you might be running cattle and sheep or horses and goats, but you're not necessarily running them together. And if that's the case, let the, the sheep or goats eat first and then follow the cattle behind them. That way you can pull them off before they get to that four inches. And if the cattle have to eat lower, then they can handle the worms that are sheep or goat worms, but they kind of act as a dead end host, the cattle do. Co-species grazing, meaning you're grazing them together. So your, your cattle and your sheep are together or your horses and your goats are together and they're just eating at the same time. Rotational grazing is another great practice, um, especially for those forage heights to maintain, but also to help extend the grazing season where they might have a paddock that they've planted. Um, so they've got some extra forages to graze a little bit longer than having to feed hay. Um, so again, if, if you're doing multi-species grazing and, and rotational grazing, put the sheep and goats in there first, followed by your second species. So some forages um, to think about that sheep and goats do prefer or will eat. Grasses, they will eat fescue. Some people ask me about fescue toxicity. And if all they're eating is fescue, they're eventually gonna have some issues with toxicity. However, they can handle it a lot better than cattle can. So you don't see it near as much as you do in cattle. Um, but Bahia grasses, Sudan grasses, those things are really good. The problem with like Bahia grasses, it's not a very lush forage. And so um, helping to keep them from getting to the ground and, and instead of just eating the tops of them can be hard, but it is, is possible. So legumes, they're gonna eat clover. They love clover, but just like with cattle, you need to watch out for bloat issues. Alfalfa, lespedizas, all of those things are, are good for sheep and goats. So browse and forbs, especially when we're talking about goats, they'll clean things out and they'll eat them up. Multiflora rose is a common one we see them eating. So the brassicas, plantain chicory, they've got asterisks beside them because sometimes they, they need a little bit of coaxing to get them to eat because of palatability. So if you've planted a paddock of brassicas to help with some extra forage and to extend that grazing season, then you may need to just turn them out a little bit at a time, just for a, a short amount of time until they're eating it very well, um, because it is a little bit of a, a taste adjustment for them. So here are some pictures just to prove that sheep and goats really do eat those weeds or those forbs. Um, so we've got some multiflora rose, a green briar, um, some shrubs. This down here that the sheep is eating on is buttercup. So that's, that's nice to help us the natural get rid of buttercup. And then over here is some docks. So we see that a lot. Um, so in addition, if you are multi-species or co-species grazing, sheep and goats can really help add um, to your pasture value in terms of they're gonna go eat some of those weeds, whereas the cattle won't. So you're getting more utilization out of your pasture. Condensed tannins are really sought out and important for small ruminants because they have natural anthelmintic properties, so they can act as a natural dewormer for sheep and goats. So these things, cattle producers consider weeds, especially Cerecia lespedeza, but we love it for sheep and goats um, because they'll go eat those tender leaves off of those stems, and again, it acts as a natural dewormer. But chicory and bird's foot treeful do the same things. They have the same properties. 
Um, Cerecia, you can actually find in hay and pelleted forms. So if, if worms are a problem, that might be some alternative solutions for people who maybe don't want to use chemical dewormers or chemical dewormers aren't working on their farms. So let's talk about some feeding strategies. So flushing, and I'm not talking about flushing in terms of reproduction. Um, flushing, when we talk about sheep and goats, is a form of elevating the plane of nutrition around breeding season. So we do this to help boost ovulation um, and conception and embryo implantation rates. And it also helps the females to start exhibit estrus. And we do this in order for some of those thinner ones to get some weight on them to be at a ideal body condition score to breed. So this not isn't necessarily for those ones that are in the four and five body condition range. This is for those ones who are a little bit thinner that need to get some weight so they can breed. Um, it also helps to increase the lambing and kidding rates by 10 to 20 percent, and that affects your bottom line. So anything that affects the bottom line, we like to try so we can get a little bit more money in our pockets. So again, it, it works best on mature females because your young females, either you're already feeding them and supplementing them so they'll grow. So you're, in a sense, already flushing them. Do it at the beginning of breeding season, and it also is good if you're doing an out of breeding season program. So sheep and goats are seasonal breeders, meaning when the days start getting shorter, that's when they start breeding. So typically we breed in late summer and fall, and then we have a late winter or spring kid or lamb crop. So if you're out of season breeding, you're doing the reverse. You're breeding in the late winter, spring, and you're going to be lambing and kidding in the late summer, fall. So again, flushing is one of those ways to help them come into estrus. So if you've got body condition scores that are that normal to below range, then that's when this is really going to work. Because if you've got a fat, happy animal, feeding them extra isn't really going to do anything in terms of... Um, breeding. So body condition scoring is a different scale than cattle. Cattle is a one to nine. In sheep and goats, we use a one to five scale. And it can be a little tricky, especially when we're talking about wool sheep. So it's really important to get your hands on those animals so you can feel along their spine to see if they are thin because wool sheep have thick wool on them and you can't just visually look to say, oh, that one's fat because she may look fat, but she may have a few inches of wool on her that makes her look that way. So you can feel of them along their spine to really understand if there's some condition on them or not. So average is a three. Um, and then if we get four and fives, we're starting to get a little fat, but we also don't want them to be too thin. So use versus dose when we talk about flushing, um, it's going to be about a four to six week process for sheep. So two to three re weeks before you start breeding and then go ahead and continue to two to three weeks during breeding season. And then for goats, it's going to be a little bit longer, about six to eight weeks. So three to four weeks before you want to start breeding, start feeding them and then continue three to four weeks into breeding season. So if you have a really high quality pasture that they can be turned out on, then you don't have to worry about supplementing. But if you don't have a high quality pasture, then supplementing about a half to a pound of grain per female is fine. And again, you don't have to go buy something expensive. You could use um, corn or wheat, oats or barley. Any of those things will work just fine. Creep feeding. So this is something that producers are probably doing right now um, since they've got animals on the ground and we're thinking about weaning. So it provides an extra plane of nutrition and it also helps to facilitate that weaning. So they're starting to eat, they're learning to eat, and they're starting to understand what grain is. So it's important if you are weaning to place your 
creepers in a high traffic area. So something along the path of where the water source is or the barn is that they go in every day or at night. So it's not going to be beneficial if you say, oh, here's a good flat spot, but they don't ever go over there. So make sure it's in a high traffic area. And you can start this as early as two weeks old. So they can start getting used to eating and um, making sure that they're ready to go ahead. And especially if you've got orphaned animals that have been bottle feeding, because milk replacer is expensive. So sometimes we want to get them on grain as quickly as possible. So you'll see that a lot. So just a general rule of thumb, if you're feeding sheep or, or goats that are less than 50 pounds, you can use a higher crude protein level. If they're under 50 pounds, you don't need as high of a crude protein level. On average, I would say if somebody just randomly called you up and wanted to know information or what they should be feeding, just tell them 16% is fine. Um, but the key to creek feeding, especially sheep and goats, is that those creek gates are small enough. So they don't have to be very wide, you know, just five to six inches probably and a foot tall. They just need to be wide enough for those little animals to get in, but not so wide that the smallest female can get in there or, or mature doe or you. So some additives that we can use in creek feed are coccidia stats to help control coccidiosis. Um, there are some that are labeled for sheep and goats. So Decox is labeled for sheep and young goats. Bovatec is labeled for sheep in confinement and Remensen is labeled for goats. So there are those options out there. Ammonia chloride we can add to help acidify um, the urine. So in sheep, a half a percent. And for goats, you can go up as high as 2%. And so this helps to prevent urinary calculi, which we do have issues with in those young, particularly male animals. Another buffer you could add is um, sodium bicarbonate to help with bloat if they're out on pastures that are lush with clover and they're creeping them. So that's just another buffer you could add. So here's some resources if you have a producer call you and say, hey, can you help me figure a ration or, or help me figure what the nutritional needs are for these animals? Langston has a Langston Interactive Nutrient cal Calculator, so they call it LINK, and it's specifically designed for goats. Montana State University has a sheep ration program that uh, you can use. You do have to create a login, however, it is free to use. And then Maryland has a small ruminant spreadsheet calculators that are good for both sheep and goats. And it's simply an Excel program that you download and then you plug your numbers in. It has instructions on how to use it. And then John has created the grazing and hay calculators. On the grazing calculator, he does have a little um, note there that I think they figured two to three sheep or goats is, a, is the equivalent of one cow unit kind of a deal. And then on the hay calculator, there is specific columns for sheep and goats. So those are available to you. Um, you can simply just Google them and they'll pop up. So some common nutritional diseases. I'm not going to go over all of these individually. Um, I just wanted to put these out there. There are a lot of things associated with nutritional disorders and, and they occur at various stages of the life cycles. Um, so it's very important that producers are supplementing if they need to supplement. They have good quality pastures out there for those sheep and goats to graze. Um, so we don't have to deal with these things and have to, to take money out of our pockets and put it through medication when we could have just prevented it in the first place. So um, those are these are some common things we do see in Arkansas and that producers come across on a, a regular basis. And I know Dr. Powell talked about some of these in his presentation. So again, I'm not, I'm not gonna go over them in detail. I just wanted to point them out. So with that, my presentation is short and sweet this morning. Just wanted to go over the basics with you. So does anybody have any questions? 